Welcome to our last session of the conference. It's called Activism and the Arts. And I am proud to announce our speakers for these sessions. For this session here, they are Cyrus Marcus Ware. Cyrus is a Vineyard scholar, visual artist, activist, creator, and educator. He's a core team member of Black, Black Lives Matter Toronto. Cyrus has won several awards, including the TD Diversity Award in 2017. Cyrus was voted as best queer activist by Now Magazine in 2005. Cyrus is a PhD candidate at, U at York University in the Faculty of Environmental Studies. Sage Patagas is Anisha Nabekwe and Elk clan from Atike Mikshin Anishna Bek, a reserve in Robinson Huron Treaty territory. A graduate of Humber's film and television production program, Patagas is an experienced actor, assistant director, location mixer, and post sound editor. Charles C. Smith is a poet, uh, playwright, and essayist who has written and edited 14 books. Charles is the executive director of cultural pluralism. Plur I'm so sorry, of cultural pluralism in the arts movement Ontario, and artistic director of the Wind in the Leaves Collective. And the moderator for this panel discussion is Melinda Ayanga. She's a Toronto-based artist, activist, and founder of Diva Day. She has a, an, an honorous bachelor degree in musical theater performance and passion for people. Melindy, I pass the floor to you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Melindy Ayenga. Um, and just, I am a theater artist living and working in Toronto. And I am your moderator for today. So I just want to dive right in because we have beautiful minds here and I don't want to waste any more time. Um, so obviously, this panel is in response to a climate that is um, pressing. And I think um, we all know that it's been pressing. This is not new. Um, but the, the attention is new and that um, I'm, I'm so grateful that we get to be responsible for how we how we direct this attention. So the first question I want to ask is why do we think that organizations continue to fail in their anti racism efforts? What is it that um, yeah, keeps failing because we see them put out statements, we see them implement whatever, and then it falls apart. So what is, well, yeah, what do you think? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the very root, the very nature of a lot of these organizations is that they were founded on white supremacy. They were founded on colonialism. And museums are, you know, they, they show the spoils of war. They show the spoils of colonialism, you know? Um, the, the collecting uh, and, the, and the, the, the founders and the donors made their money through slave trades. I mean, this is, the, there's blood in, in all of this uh, money in a lot of these institutions. And so we have to recognize that as a sort of a founding structural core uh, tenant of our, the very field, right? So um, then when we look at things like putting out a statement or doing a half an hour anti-racism training, how does that actually address any of the structural problems that have been inherent since the beginning of a lot of these institutions? I think of legacy institutions that started in 1901 or, or that started, you know, like, as well as ones that started in the 60s and whatever. So I just, you know, without sort of addressing the structural issues, uh, it all ends up being band-aids. So they don't address the lack of hiring of Black people in, in, and the sort of white supremacy and anti-Blackness in hiring and in HR practices. They don't address the lack of collecting and showing and criti critiquing and engaging with Black artists uh, in, in museums and galleries and shows and dance festivals. They don't address you know, the ways that sort of systemic racism um, and, and classism, you know, only targets particular people to be audience members and that, you know, only and that shuts out entire communities from being able to engage with the work. So, so they just haven't, none of these things actually address the root causes. So this is part of the problem. We just keep doing, you know, things that make people feel like they can tick off a box of having done the work, but they don't ever do anything that upsets the apple cart. They don't ever do anything that changes the structure or unbalances the power or re distributes power to Black and Indigenous people. I mean, that's what we are asking for now. Yeah. That's what people are calling for now. And that's what people are, are demanding. So they're going to have to get with it. Well, yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head there. It is about a redistribution of power. And that is like the only answer that is the only anti-racist effort that is going to be successful because it does address the systemic um, nature of it. And like, 
just spiritually, you think about the United States or Canada or the arts industry, it is all rooted in racism. It is built off of bloodshed. And so of course it's gonna be rotten. It's not a surprise. Um, and so we have to change what the core is. And that's a big, uh, it, it, it seems like a big ask. There, it, it seems like it's a big ask. Well, yeah. it is a big ask, but I prefer Cyrus's term. It's a demand that has been around for some time. And one of the questions that I find, because I've been doing this work for quite some time, is that, um, you know, folks don't want to look at the history. I mean, just listening to the way that we're having this conversation, we can talk about blood, we can talk about murder, we can talk about how many bodies are in the Atlantic Ocean, we can talk about the number of lynchings, we can talk about that we are on First Nations territory, and yet, um, you know, we, we say the land acknowledgements, but how much are we acting around the land acknowledgements? How much are we allied? with uh, indigenous people on sovereignty and so on is really, and I find at times that people would rather ignore the depth of pain, uh, the depth that this is, so for example, when I say to people, you know, did you know how many people King Leopold murdered in the Congo? And I say, huh? And then I say 15 million. This is 40 years before the Holocaust, right? How many successful roads kill in what was then called Rhodesia, now we call Zimbabwe. How many lynchings have there been? How many bodies are in the Atlantic Ocean? My understanding, there were 100 million indigenous people on this continent, Turtle Island, before European colonization. I may be wrong with that, but I understand now 25 million, right? So this is the problem. People sort of feel like, oh, that's just too much. I wasn't responsible for that. But they're living off the privileges of that. And in the arts in particular, it's the stories we have experienced that they don't want to hear. That they don't want to hear because it confronts them with our lives. On one hand, they'll tell us art should come from our lives. Well, this is art that comes from our lives. Oh, no, 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 we don't mean that. We want some flowers and we want some speculation about your spirituality and that kind of stuff. And you know, whatever, your intoxications. We're trying to survive here, recapture our past, bring it into contemporary, and, came, and gain some space. And Cyrus said, really well, this is one pie. They got to give up their parts of the pie. There's no new pie coming here. <laughs> yeah, and especially, you know, that relates back to our global climate crisis. There is no other planet being given to us. This is the only one we have. Uh, yeah. Sage, did you have any thoughts about organizations and, and their anti-racist efforts failing? What, what's that, what that's about? Uh, so I'm at home right now and like my, I'm like also with my family and my brother's having, my little brother's having like really tough time right now. So I'm like, I'm like here. So um, I'm also thinking about him because yeah. he's a little guy. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I will say just about this, is that I think that these organizations have a really hard time. Can I have a moment? I'm sorry. Absolutely, no need to apologize. No worries. Yeah, this is the beauty of, of you know, working from home and, and continuing to, these conversations. Life, yeah, wait for no person. Um, okay. I have an eight-year-old and all, everything that I've done online in the last two months has had a little head pop up at one point or a foot, you know, and yeah. she just, she likes to insert herself into the, into the show. So. That's horrible. <laughs> um, well, so while we're just waiting for Sage to join us again, um, let's kind of go further and say what, what supports need to be in place to facilitate this uh, actual change and this, this exchange of power. And perhaps we can start with like supports for, um, like, so if, if there is going to, yeah, like how do we, how do we do the power exchange? How do we um, make it a smooth transition for everyone? Because I know that, you know, for people who hold the power, there is a lot of ego and resistance and discomfort and fear and all of these big scary feelings about relinquishing the power, even though you may know that it's the right thing to do. So perhaps for those people, how do we get them to, to, to release power? Well, you know, I, I think they have to give up uh, a piece of the pie mm -hmm. and it has to go in community. 
Um, so some of the work that we're doing now is how do we really create hubs within the black arts community so that we can come together regularly, that we can kind of consider where we're coming from, the challenges that we're facing, how do we marshal our resources to create uh, advocacy uh, outside, to create connections within our own community and so on. I mean, I think, you know, the institutions, I mean, this, I love this conversation when really you talk about EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion. You notice who the institutions are that are saying it. I mean, basically what they're saying is, yeah, we'll, we'll take you into our mainstream, historical, traditional organizations, but then you have to give up who you are, right? And do their practices. So yeah, they can be more representative, but are they really? Are they truly opening up to the aesthetic practices that we have? And when some of us go in there, what are we losing from community? What are we losing here? And we are the ones who build our craft, who build the practices that we have, and being pushed into a pulled into all these other directions, largely because it's financial, we want to survive, mm -hmm. is uh, taking away from our capacity to build a foundation upon which we can uh, accent our arts practices, connect with each other, and advocate out, build our communities. That has to, to me, that's first. I, I'm really getting a little tired of change the institution so that we can improve. No, no, no. It's got to be, we have to have the reason. We have to have choices. Yeah. We have it makes to have me think about. It makes me think about, uh, just to make an analogy, but it makes me think about abolition, right? Like when we talk about abolition, we're not just talking about tearing down the structures that don't work. We're talking about planting this beautiful garden that is going to grow in its place and, and, and nourishing. And, and I think supporting Black artists and supporting Black administ arts administrators and supporting Black curators to do all of this, you know, incredible work. I think about, but I also think like that there is a role there's a moment where, um, you know, that beautiful, uh, a small matter of engineering uh, artwork that, that Cara Springer made, the freestanding billboard that just said, white people do something, you know? And I think that, that that's such a powerful work. And I think that we need leaders, arts leaders in a lot of these institutions to do something. And so mm -hmm. I look at the leadership of someone like Andrew Russell, who is a white theater director at the Intamin Theater in Seattle. And he was like, theater has a whiteness problem. There's an issue with whiteness, systemic whiteness. You know, there, there's this, there's a, that, you know, that, and, and that no amount of specialty programming or bringing in BLM to do something for a workshop is gonna cure. And so what he did was he was like, I'm just gonna, you know, he was a young director. He was new in the field. He was new in the career. He was, he was a tremendously successful. And he said, I'm immediately starting a succession plan so that I can hand over my leadership to Black women. And that's what he did. And so he stepped aside. And so we need more people to do that, to say, actually, I need to step aside mm -hmm. now. The conversation is not for me to lead now. I need to actually step aside and make that space. Um, and I think we need more people actually doing that. Performative allyship is over. Mm -hmm. We need demonstrative change. We need you to actually do something as Cara Springer's billboard implores us to do, right? Yes. And I think that that kind of answers my question. We need the people who have the power to trust that if they relinquish it, it's going to be... Um, handled with care and handled responsibly and handled uh, positively. Like there, it's not, there really is nothing to be afraid of except for um, the world getting better or, or people feeling like they're being represented and there will be other opportunities for you. There are always other opportunities for you. That's the point. The point is there's not as many for us because of Oh, melanin. Um, so for whatever reason, and and yeah, I think that there there just has to be some trust in that that, that this is <laughs> this is the right thing, even though it's scary. Yeah. Oh my goodness! If you, I mean, I don't know if you saw there was like a, a fake article. It was fake news. It wasn't real, but there oh. was a fake news article that went around very briefly that that the Seattle Museum was going to divest and and turn its leadership over to black communities or something like that. And people were oh. sharing it around before it was like, oh, babe, no, that's obviously yeah. not really going to happen. But for that split second when I saw it, I was like, ah. It's, it's as simple as that, right? Because yeah. of course, am I worried that the elite directors of these institutions are not gonna land on their feet and find other work? Not at all. Of course, they're going to be fine. Please, please, please open up the space for, for a better conversation. 
Yeah. And it's also like, we've never seen this before. So what are you afraid of? We don't know what it looks like to have a whole big ass museum curated by black women, for example. We, I don't know that we've seen it on that scale. So the, there is, there's nothing, but we have seen what you're doing right now. So I, I don't understand what, how you can create this whole anxiety story that when BIPOC artists are given space that it's going to be detrimental to your either experience of the arts or to your perspective of the world or whatever it, it, it can only be nourishing because it's new and I feel like that's the thing that really gets me about um when that racism happens or othering happens in an art sphere is we are the people who are connected to the world emotionally so intensely that we have to express it somehow beyond just oh the sky is really nice today you know we, we we it's more than that and how we can yeah start to judge and then box it in and then separate and exclude just defeats the whole purpose and and your art will be stale and it will be boring when it's just this same thing over and over again. I don't, yeah. yeah. But, that is, but that is what they want, let's be honest. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass over 150 years ago said, power exceeds nothing without a demand. You know, and so here we are demanding. Yeah. And what do they have? To, and this is where they have to, you know, they're thinking, what do they have to lose? Yeah, they might be able to go to another job. There's a movie I saw a while ago, it was called Putney Slope. And it was the lone black guy on a board of directors, some big international company. And the chair of the board dies. Um, and so they have to have a vote on who the new board chair will be. So they have the new board election and uh, you know it's a tie. But then they realize nobody voted for Putney, the only black guy on the board. So then they all vote again. And each of them individually thinks, well, I'll give, him, I'll give a vote to Putney so he doesn't feel so bad. Well, he wins unanimously. Then, you know, one white guy says, we hope you don't change much. The next scene is a party, all black bodies. <laughs> it's just like, and, and, and that's the fear. You know, you can't, you can't look at these institutions and just say it's the person at the top. Once the person at the top comes in, other things begin to fall away. For example, in museums, who are the researchers? So at the ROM, when they apologize for Into the Heart of Africa, they had black curators come in to do something that was more disruption because it only was going to last for a period of time. It wasn't going to be permanent, but right? it wasn't going to be on the floor permanently. And we see this all the time. It's like these little things that I get, oh yeah, you can have this little bit of space because they don't want to give up control. Gaslighting. It's part literally of the gaslighting. Part of, the it, it, one, yeah. part of the problem of that is they know that we have more access to data because we're double, triple, quadruple conscious. They are not. They are not. And they know we can bring in what you were just saying, Lindy, but it's not their interest. Mm. Sorry, uh, leave on that. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I wrote an article for Canadian Art yesterday that was called Give Us Permanence, right? Because, of course, we're tired of... Of, uh, of just sort of the tokenistic inclusion or the temporary takeover or the art intervention in the gallery, I think, or in the festival or in the, you know, that this is a moment actually where we're saying, you know, uh, you know every, everything actually needs to be kind of reshaped. And Susan Cahan wrote that book, Mounting Frustrations, Art in the Art Museum in the Age of Black Power. And she chronicles like 40 or 50 years that show that it's only in moments of civil unrest or protest that the art museum or that the gallery condescends sends to engage with Black artists and always, only, always in a kitchen table gallery or a small side shop or a po you know, poster series or something small and demonstrative, never acquisitions into the permanent collection, never please will you join our board of directors. Now, you know, like they're very, very specific things. And she's done such a beautiful job at an entire book that just chronicles all of these stories. And so that's what I was, you know, writing about in this article was just talking to other people who had similar experiences of that. Yeah. So when we, we talk about like, yeah, basically these, like this gaslighting or this tokenizing or these little brief moments of, of space that is then taken away. Can you just tell me a little bit more about how that is damaging and what that says to you and what that message is? Well, basically that we are there for when they want to connect with us. So for example, you know, both of the organizations, arts organizations I work in, we exist on project grants. 
the difficulty of project grants is we're always on the hustle. Now we know about the hustle because that's who we are, we're from the constant. Mm -hmm. But depriving, and we've been deprived of operating grants, right, significant grants, um, doesn't allow us to really build cohesion within the organization, build membership, build services, build political capital, build relationships with funders. So we're always going after one after one after one. And you know, but, and what really gets me in this day and age is that we, oh, we all want equity. Yeah, we want to you know address anti-black racism. We want to you know get on with First Nations people and so on and so forth. But within, as Cyrus had said, within their box, within yeah. their box, they can contain it. They can make it temporary. They can buy time for making it temporary, which is one of the things I worry about now at this moment. Is are they going to try to buy time so that January? This is the past. And that's the dilemma because, you know, again, we get drawn in a thousand different directions. It's hard to keep up the struggle. You know, I know this Max Roche piece I play to myself called Members Don't Get Weary. And we can't. This is our life from cradle to grave. We cannot get weary, but that's what they're counting on. That's what they're counting on. And, you know, I look at it and I kind of say, you know, I mean, um, Tanisha Tate of uh, Cahoots Theater on Facebook put out something a while ago saying it's really good to see all of these theater companies putting out statements of anti-black racism, but I'm not seeing black folk on this stage. I'm not seeing black folk in the administration. I might see janitorial staff, <laughs> right? I mean, so the hypocrisy, but yeah. people feel they're buying time. Yeah. Well, someone will say, yay, they spoke up for us. Well, no, they didn't. I'm tired. I mean, Baldwin said it best. No. I don't judge you by what you say. I judge you by what you do. And I'm not seeing much happening here, so. And just, just to continue calling the names, let's call Nina Simone into this and this too slow. Mississippi, goddamn. Yeah. I, keep, I keep on saying, go slow, right? Go slow. Yeah. But that's just the trouble, too slow, right? And this is like, you know, it's been, you know, it, you know, it's, it's 2020. Like we, like enough. You know, we, we wait enough of the small changes of the in incremental, you know, they always say that, that changing, changing a gallery or a museum or a, a large institution is like trying to steer a giant battleship. And I'm like, honey, while you're trying to steer that, we've built an entire armada of tiny ships around you. We are building our own, like, too slow, we will take this ship down, you know? Yeah. So. yeah, and well, also so many theater companies or arts institutions have made this quick pivot to adapt to these circumstances now of not being able to congregate because of coronavirus and COVID and social distancing. So they are they are capable of, of doing a quick change to move their whole season or their whole um, communication with their membership online. So they're, and, and because we have the power of the internet, we do have access to so many more different people, so many more different partners. Hello, Sage, welcome back. Um, <laughs> no worries, we were just chatting about um, companies gaslighting or organizations kind of gaslighting uh, BIPOC artists by giving us moments of to come in, but then they're taken away again. So yes, we, they, they, can, they can change. And we we're talking about how it's going too slow and that we need to make dramatic change right now. And again, I'll bring it up again, the climate crisis, like we don't have infinite time. There is, there is a crunch. So it's not only because you know, we've been making these demands for so long that we're like, hey, like, like, let's just do it. It's also this, there's a greater, there's a greater kind of clock <laughs> ticking uh, to be a little ominous. So when we do finally have um, BIPOC artists being not just included for a moment or not just included on a certain level at all levels of the hierarchy in the arts, what do we need to do to make sure that when things go wrong because they will that's life and for example i as an artist show up to the day when uh we're picking co we're costuming for a show and i'm given a pair of beige tights because somebody didn't realize that there's a person of color in the cast and needs brown tights because they have brown skin where do how, how do we make sure that i can um there's this place for me to go and say this has happened to me and that i won't have to be the one to deal with fixing the problem because I just noticed it. I'm not the problem. I'm just clocking it. How do I, how do we make sure that it's safe to bring those things up so that uh, the, we can continue to work in community with one another? 
Well, one of the sad issues for us, sadly, and I'm saying sad twice there because that is double, um, is that these folks really don't know. I mean, it's incredible. I was in a Zoom session last week, um, a week ago, or something like that. Someone from Nova Scotia, a white woman, who knew nothing about Black presence in Nova Scotia. Oh, and I'm like, huh? What? How <laughs> could you not know? I mean, but yet, I mean, so, you know, the, the, the reality is they believe they don't need to know our lives because really, whether they say it or not, we're not important. Mm. Uh, any constructive way of setting the agenda. And so they know us very thinly. They know us as we sound like them or we work in the same spaces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that shifts the onus to us that say, uh, I don't feel so good about this. And of course we get tired of that because it's like over and over and over. I'm sure all of us have been on so many calls over the last week about, oh hi, God. I want advice from you about how to, do I have a statement? What should the statement say? And where should I send it to? And I have a conflict on my board and I have a conflict with my staff. And I, like, oh man, you know, and, and so actually, to be honest with you, last few days, I've just said, I'm sorry, I can't answer your question right now. You know, you don't realize that in asking the question, you're putting me into more emotional labor where frankly, up to here and beyond, you know? And, and, and so that's a dilemma because then how do they get to know? Yeah. Right? When they're so um, willfully uh, ignorant of what this is. It's, and, and then to talk about the stuff that we started off at the beginning of the conversation, when you get into, you know, it's not just people disappeared, they were murdered. Yep. Jamaica Kincaid says it, let's be honest. These aren't war heroes. These are criminals. These are murderers. Watch these stations come down. They're, whether it's Cecil Rhodes or the, 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 the Confederate generals in the United States, these were murderers supported by their state at the time. Mm -hmm. No one wants to talk about that no. except for us <laughs> because it's been our ancestors and us right now that they continue to kill. Yeah. And I think about like the, the, the need. So like it's for black and indigenous people in the arts, we are constantly put in that position, just as you said, Charles, of always having to be the whistleblower of always having to be, but at the same time, we also are trying to protect our communities from experiencing more harm. So we're doing the work in the institution to try to prevent them from being as racist as they are, you know, and then internalizing that because of course we experience the racism, but we prevent it from going public, you know, and we keep doing that and then it protects it saves space the institution gets to save face we do it because we don't want to re-traumatize our communities so we intervene in the racism and then the institution gets to still look good and me and we're these this go-between so it makes it really hard for a lot of uh black and indigenous and and, and racialized folks to stay in the arts because it yeah. is so exhausting and that's i think one of the the biggest crises. i think that we can think about it in that way we are losing brilliant amazing, yeah. incredible people who are not sticking around in the arts because of the violence that they're experiencing or because of their like fetish of always having to be there. I like yeah. to comment on that too. Yeah. Like I heard what you were saying, like in your initial opening, uh, I really respected what you're saying about like how those roots in um, like these institutions have in colonialism, like it totally carries to how like they're run today. So I think that this struggle with like maintaining um, like our people in those fields is, a, there's a lot of mistrust we have in the way that they're run in general. So like, I, I feel like personally, I, like I feel a lot of mistrust in the way that like things are like hierarchically run yeah. and how that translates to me as a person, just, it doesn't even like, it doesn't even like fit, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's that argument of like um, trying to fit the circle with the triangle. So yeah. in the way that those systems are shaped, it doesn't make sense to a lot of our people, even if um, like a lot of our people don't have that, uh, a, a whole lot of knowledge on like how our own people would have run things just because we, we're not familiar with them. We're not around them all the time. And so how that translates to us being like in other foreign systems, it's, it's just like, I don't feel like what how you're running this organization is right. I don't feel like it's a fit for me, but I really don't have a frame of reference of how it could be run. 
<laughs> which I think in turn, which I think in turns like in turn it, it um, a lot of our people are are choosing to create their own smaller projects yep. in their community. And so working in communities is oftentimes like prioritized. Like we know how to treat our own people, or I mean, we're working towards that too. If we if we don't, right? Because yeah. a lot of our people struggle with that too. Um, and I'll, I'll just say, like for example, like uh, we're ha uh, there was. Um, a small group of people in, around the Georgian Bay area. So that's just four hours north of Toronto um, or a couple hours north of Toronto. And um, I really respected what they're doing. Like it was just this young woman I knew, uh, Kyla Judge, and she's from Shawanaga First Nation. And what I saw was her prior prioritization of like bringing the knowledge carriers in, um, creating uh, an environment that where all the community was able to come and participate everyone was fed, everyone was like um, taken care of. And I think that's also like a piece too, is like, we, you need to like, if you want the community out there and like in there, you gotta make sure like they're fed, they're, you yeah. gotta make sure like they're they feel good about being there. They're not yeah. like a burden or they don't feel like out of place in, yep. in a system. Like, so it's like, like y'all were saying about how like the, like who is the art for then? Like what? <laughs> yeah. So like yeah. the canoe like there's a lot of like teachings and like how you build it and all of that but then also there's a lot of importance in like how is that art gonna keep going how is it gonna re re uh i don't say service but like how how is it gonna reservice the community again so mm. well, i think point, i think it's really i mean because you know sage said something really important about how people are coming together in community I mean, you know, I look at the way, I mean, the two organizations that I work with are ones I created. Um, and I created them because I really got tired of bureaucracies. And I've been in many. And I have seen some really good anti-racism work in some of them. Uh, but they die uh, because leadership changes. People don't want it anymore. How yeah. deep are you going? And next thing you know, I'm out the door. <laughs> and they come back. And so I said, enough of that. Enough of that. And what I'm finding, and this is something that you know really blends with my arts practice. So my group, Women in Leeds, for example, we're totally collaborative. You know, so when we say choreography, it's the collective. It's just mm -hmm. the way we work. When we look at the way we get together in rehearsal, we might work for about 30 minutes doing some work on the floor. And then we might have a conversation for the next 30 minutes about what was that? And how was each person contributing to it? How were they feeling? And because, yes, we're led by Black bodies, um, we also have non-Blacks who are in the program as well. So how do we educate them? Bring, how do they seek out the knowledge of this process and of the subject matter we're dealing with? Because we're dealing with issues around Black lives um, and so on. The poetry is mine and it comes out of that Black arts experience. The music comes out of predominantly avant-garde jazz. And the way those musicians work is pretty much the same way. So we get a chance to really build up Practices. I don't want to call them alternative practices because that's not what they are. They're aesthetic practices that root us to who we are over time. So for me, I can see the practice linking back to the Griots in various parts of Southern Africa and so on, up through slavery, up through the Harlem Renaissance, up through the Black uh, arts movement to today, right? There's a continuum. And that continuum has always relied upon collaborative work. Each person brings their spirit, their creativity, their vision to the process, and it gets shared. Yes. That is not what happens in a lot of other companies. An yes. artistic director comes in, this is it, period. Mm -hmm. And go. And, then, and when you have people or BIPOC artists in the space, it's their their understanding or their vision of how they want you to fit into their puzzle that is being forced upon you. Um, and it's, and that can't possibly be anything close to authentic. Yeah. Did anybody else want to speak to that? Well, yeah, I just think that, you know, it's, it's back to what you were saying, um, about this triangle in a, in a round, in a round hole. Yep. It's, it's, yeah, you can't like take my theater experience, my education, um, in a class of 48 students at a musical theater college, uh, there were two visible people of color, myself and one other um, woman. And, you know, it, it's just such a testament to like, and you can go, you can see in first year how many 
hip hop artists there are, and then how many of those people actually graduate. So you can, we can say like, yes, you're accepting people into the institution, you're hiring people, whatever, but do they stay? Does it last? Is the institution a, a place that is safe and nourishing for these people to not only survive, but like flourish? And my friend Sierra and I would talk often about, you know, how much better would we be if we hadn't spent let's say 15% of our time trying to facilitate a, a, a safe learning environment for ourselves. And, and, and not that it's easy to do that either. It's, it is work and to be met with backlash and to be met with ignorance and people who don't want to change anything for you, but they want you to be there so their school can look diverse. And, and when you add on the fact that I am paying $10,000 to be here. So I think yeah. that I should probably have a say in um, who gets to teach me in, in what I'm learning and how my um, inquiries and my concerns are being addressed. Uh, and I think it also comes down to like hierarchy and ageism as well to having young students trying to speak up, you know, oftentimes they're just kind of brushed away because of the youngness. And then you compound it with my racialized body <coughs> and gendered experience and all that kind of stuff as well. And it's deeply discouraging. And so, yeah, you're like, this is not made for me. I love to sing. I love to storytell. I love to play music and, and meet people and interact and collaborate. Um, and the only institutions that offer opportunities for that don't work so where do I go what do I do how do I art and that's when you have these incredible you know independent projects that start off um and and that's then they, they it starts about community because it's about the people first it's about who is not being invited what can we do to make them feel included and then we can you know figure out how we're going to teach singing and all that kind of stuff afterwards you brought such an important point and I think that this idea of arts education and who is doing the teaching, who's in these programs that are then funneling into all into all of these institutions and organizations, you know, is, is a really crucial thing. Like I, I think about my art school experience and my goodness, I don't think I had a, a professor of color. I, I certainly didn't have a black professor. And I think, you know, I do this a lot in trainings when I'm training people, I ask people, what was the first time that you had a black teacher? And it's not in grade one, it's not in grade nine. It's oh not even God. in their masters usually, you know? It's it's usually like not until, when was the first time that you had an indigenous professor or an indigenous Never. teacher teach you? What, just, just please name it for me. I'd love to, I do that in training and people are stunned when they actually think about it. And they're like, oh, that's true. So, th so we're not in the education. We're not actually getting the jobs, doing the teaching, you know? So we're not, we're not in the curriculum. You know, it's, the curriculum isn't being taught, you know, to, to be inclusive of the stories of Black and Indigenous lives. You know, the arts curriculum, I was in a, a, a class at a, a, a well, I, 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 I went to, to U of T, I was in an, an, an art history class, and I was told that the reason why the textbook and the course didn't have a lot of art by uh, Black and Indigenous women was because they didn't, they didn't start making work until the 60s because they were busy with colonization processes and they were busy, 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 and they didn't start <laughs> that they didn't start making work until the sixties, and that then there wasn't really good documentation of it. And I was like, and this was taught as a fact. This was taught as a fact in school. So the, we're not in the curriculum. We're not doing the teaching, and 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 we're not we're not showing up. And that's who's this is. These are the schools that are feeding into the theater companies, into yep. the dance companies, yep. into the arts institutions, into the museum study fields. And that you know, th this is part of the problem. This is part of the structural problem. It's not just in the institutions. It's also in the education system that is Absolutely. failing Black artists, Black and, and Indigenous artists over and over again. Mm -hmm. I would say it's failing all. I mean, yes, certainly Black, Indigenous, other racialized artists um, and marginalized. But yes, it's failing us, all of us. But, yeah. uh, you know, as Cyrus said, I, I teach, I've been teaching now for, um, I guess, 18 years. In every class, um, sort of what Cyrus does in a workshop, I always say to them, identify the two most important institutions in your life. And invariably, they come to education and parents. And I said, what's the big com biggest conversation you have with your parents about education? I said, okay, good. This is just their facts, like no evaluation. And then I said, okay, wait, let's include early childhood ed in your education, because many of these days would have been in early childhood ed. And I said, okay, how many years have you now been in these institutions, education? 
And, you know, let's say if they're, I'm now doing post-grad work. So they're 26 odd years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I say, okay, the 26 years, biggest conversation with the parents is about this. How many indigenous authors have you read in your formal education? Very few hands, if any, go up. Black, black queer, queer, South Asian, you can go on and on. And then of course I say white men and all hands go up, right? And you know, the interesting thing is that they then see, yep. you know, I then put a map of the world up on the board. Oh, you've only heard from this small part of the world. Yeah. Basically, that's what it is. And so it's about how do you expand your viewpoint to be able to engage with other things? And I also then say to them, don't just look at the years, but how many hours do you spend in school? Count your travel time, count your homework time. Who are your friends and where did you meet them? These circles of people that you have been with throughout your life, where did they come from? Your neighborhood and your school, right? So, you know, this funnel of education is really about um, substantially or, or, or firming up um, conformity to a Eurocentric paradigm that has been violently um, subjected to us. Yep. And again, like if I was answering those questions in elementary school, all of the other kids were white. All of the other kids were, um, there, there was no one that looked like me other than my sister in the grades below. And so perhaps they could say, you know, oh yeah, I had a black friend, but I can't say that. <laughs> and also, of course, my best friend is black does not mean that you have had a diverse experience or that you are not racist. It's not a get out of jail free card. Sorry, just in case you didn't know that. Um, yeah, I think yeah, that's that, what found. <laughs> I just want to call the brilliant work of Dr. Afua Cooper into the room and that beautiful poem song that she made that's called, I don't care if your nanny was black and she fed you grits for breakfast every morning and you knew a black girl in high school and she was nice. And then she goes on to say like all the reasons why she doesn't care. It is pure brilliance. And if you listen to anything this weekend, just kick back, open a lemonade and listen to that because- Oh my gosh, great. can you say the name for us again? Dr. Rafua Cooper um, and the, the song poem is called, I don't care if your nanny is black. Oh, wow. That it's is awesome. It talks about police brutality. It talks mm -hmm. about, you know, anti-Blackness. It talks about, society. It talks about so many things, but there's this, this constant refrain, right? And she yep. was nice. And I had a, and she was your best friend and she was nice. I don't care. You yeah. know, it's just so beautiful. I had a similar a student years ago who was a white student who, when we challenged around these issues, was saying that her nanny was a South Asian woman and how that woman would dress her up in saris and put a bindi and all that kind of stuff and how close they were and that she would, you know, make for her curry and roti and yada, yada, yada. And I said, well, why do you think she did that? Oh, because she loved me. I said, did she love you or you were her evaluation? Mm. Ooh. In other words, she would say to her mother, this is what we did today. It was so much fun. I put a bindi on, I had sari, we had roti, we had curry. Of course, the nanny is employed. And you know, it sent that student to shockwaves to have to think of it from that perspective. Say, you were the only way the parents in that family could tell whether or not you were being treated well by your nanny. So it's not, you know, I mean, this whole notion of uh, friendships, and I have a black mm -hmm. friend, a Asian friend, and all that kind of stuff is. Ooh, troubling, particularly in this day and age where we find, you know, as, um, you know, when I went to school, I was the only black in my class. I only had one black teacher, grade eight in math of all things. Math was my worst subject, but not that year. Right? That year. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. No, that was my best year in math. And Mr. Hayes sat on the desk when I walked in the door. I looked at him. I said, you're the teacher? He said, yes, I am. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I think my first black teacher was a black woman taught me music class in middle school and now I'm a singer. So there you go. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to take a question from uh, some people that are watching. This is from, I'm, maybe I'll keep it anonymous. I'll keep it anonymous. Um, how can organizations and companies address white fragility through training, question mark, as they begin to implement zero tolerance anti-racism policies? So I think that's, yeah, that's a good one. What do you do when the white folk are feeling personally attacked? and defensive and taking it personal? How do we continue to get them to engage and, and change? I think we can turn to the work of uh, Fractured Atlas, right? So Fractured Atlas is this arts-based organization that is loosely based around New York. They have a decentralized, I think they all work from, from home offices, but they do, uh, you may advise artists. And one of the things that they do is strategic HR and they really uh, have developed this, strat this, this team-wide strategy where they have a group and caucus structure so that the white people in their organization take responsibility for their own feelings, for their own actions, for their own learning for their own time they commit to doing a weekly caucus that and then there's also a group meeting for the for the racialized uh, members of the of the of the team so actually the racialized members get two times a week where they're away from white people which probably is a nice gift and they you know they do this important work together and they're committed to it it's threaded through the fabric of the organization so that's one example where somebody's already doing i think a good job at trying to do that you know putting the responsibility back on folks who are perpetrating the harm you know the tears actually don't stop the need for action you know the the anxiety and the stress that you feel for being called up for racism doesn't stop your need to act and your need to respond and so you know start a caucus uh, start a start a, a group at, yeah, at your organization where you're going to commit to doing readings together where you're going to commit to helping each other where you're going to commit to keeping each other accountable where you're going to actually try to make some of the structural changes in your organization that is your responsibility you know Asada Shakur says that you know, she wishes she could have been a sculptor or a painter or a gardener, but she was forced into this world of struggle because of oppression, and she was forced to be a warrior and a struggler. And Fanny Lou Hamer says, you know, we were, as racialized people, we were born in the mess, so we were caught up in doing this. For white people, they've had a choice. They haven't had to get involved. Yeah. What we're saying now is the choice is actually, the ball is in your court. This is your responsibility yeah. to do this work, to do this labor, to do this work with your people to make sure that we are addressing these things. Yeah. There are two other tools that um, I often use. One is called, it's now called the privilege walk. We used to call it getting on the bus. Uh, it allows for people to identify where they have privileges based upon race, sexual orientation, age, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really because, you know, again, the process is one where people discover where they have privilege. The then question is, what do you do about it? The other one is called the power flower, which is really much more of a self-reflection. And so in a group process or even individually, you identify the main characteristics of the dominant group. And then there are various pedals that say about race, language, immigration status, sexual orientation, et cetera. And you begin to decide, are you in the outside on race or the inside on race? In other words, how do you, how does your social identities uh, approximate to those characteristics of the dominant group? Mm. So at least you have this basis of, ah, here I, here, here am I, if answered honestly, that's the one thing, if answered honestly. That mm -hmm. can begin to open up doors to say, you know, as I do with my class, uh, to say, there's a lot we don't know. There's a language we don't know. And there's a way we have to get used to that language. So we, you know, our ears have to open a bit more um, to the nuances. So for example, take the Amy Cooper situation in New York with um, the, um, the, the bird watch, the photographer, Christopher, I'm getting his last name. Um, and you, you may know the story, a uh, white woman uh, walking her dog in a uh, part of Central Park, which is for birds, um, and the dog's supposed to be on leash. She doesn't have a dog on a leash. The guy who goes there regularly, um, you know, says, hey, you know, your dog's supposed to be on a leash. And he starts recording her um, to get her to try to stop and so on. She threatens him and says, if you don't stop recording me, I'm going to call the police and say there's an African-American man who is threatening me, right? So she knew exactly what she was doing. Yes. And when I see that, I always say, when a white woman cries, a black man dies. Yeah. And you know, I say that because in my courses, I have sat in several dean's offices. 
sitting down saying, what am I supposed to teach them? You've seen the course outline. The artists I'm using are talking about this kind of violence. I'm not, am I supposed to be responsible because they can't hear it, because they don't want to hear it? And then they go to their power base and say to the dean, uh-uh-uh, this isn't what we came with, what we signed up for. Wow. And here I am once again, here's your course outline that you signed. This is what people signed up for. And using every excuse imaginable. So, you know, there has to be a point where, and, and it can't be always our labor, where they have to begin to listen to the Nina Simones, the James Baldwin's, the Fua Coopers, the Dion Brands, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, on their own, in there. And when they have questions, where they prepare, then let's have a conversation. Yeah. But, you know, yep. until they face that, it gets wearying. And it's very, it, it's, it's a continuation of violence, I have to be honest with you. There's no time that I've ever felt comfortable sitting in a dean's office because a dean has complained about the subject matter. And, but I've been there more than I care to remember in my 18 years of teaching. And wow, I would love to contrast that with a personal experience of mine being in theater school, having uh, the program coordinator in a rehearsal hall um, use the N-word. He's a white man using the N-word um, to kind of just, context doesn't matter. He used it multiple times. And so I found myself in the Dean's office across from the associate Dean um, asking for him to address this and being told that the students who witnessed it should be the ones to address it. Um, and at no point was that teacher called in. So a white man, a white professor can use the N word and not be called into the Dean's office. And then a black professor can teach about racism and gets called into the Dean's office. And the difference is, I complained and I am a woman of color. And in your case, I'm sure that the students were white students who whose voices are being heard and recognized. And so I think it, these are the changes that need to happen. We can't do that for you. We can't be in every space making every decision for you, but you can educate yourself and allow what you learn to inform your decisions as you move forward. And it's not about whether or not you are a good or bad person. It's about whether or not you are living in reality and responding to it in a humane way. And anyway, we have just under five minutes left. So um, what is making you hopeful for the future of, of these, for these institutions? How, why do you keep talking about this stuff? What makes you believe that things are gonna change? I am fundamentally very hopeful because mm -hmm. I know about the power of the people. I've mm -hmm. witnessed it. I've been an activist for 25 years. I've been an artist for 25 years. I've you know, been organizing in the streets. I've been organizing from my bed. I've been organizing from home. I, I, I know how strong the power of the people is. I also know that ultimately we have it all. Like black <laughs> and indigenous people, this is indigenous territory and black people shaped so much of everything that's happened here. We literally are the content. Like we are, we, we started the gay liberation movement. We did like there's in so many ways we've led, we've led everything on this, on Turtle Island. You know, black and indigenous people, you know, with fungible conditions and Tiffany King and all the things that we has been written about our relationships, you know, we have we, we are it here, folks. And so we are infinitely more powerful than the state. We are infinitely more powerful than white supremacy. We are building these beautiful communities, these arts organizations. Look at the work that Charles is doing, two organizations that are dedicated to, to, to exactly eradicating the kind of erasure that we're talking about. We're building all of these, planting these new seeds and new, new organizations are gonna grow from it. We are ultimately, we're it. <laughs> We've got it. The institutions will change or die, but we're it. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna remain. We're lasting. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I believe all that. To add to that, I mean the demographics are gonna be incredibly powerful over the next little while, combined with the argument on rights and um, our place. Um, so we know the indigenous communities are the fastest growing communities in the country. But the issue with indigenous communities, we, we have to accept that this is nation to nation, not just a question of numbers. Um, and we know that um, racialized communities are now one in every four and likely to be one in every three very nearly soon. And this is what, and we see it really more starkly south of the border. 
I mean, when you see those folks, what they're fighting for is white privilege. That's what they're fighting for. They're not fighting for democracy. They're fighting for the right to dominate others. And they know they're losing the game because of the changes that are coming down. And particularly you see it now, I mean, I love Starbucks a couple of weeks ago when it said, no Black Lives Matter. Two days later, they're making t-shirts, right? So it told them something really powerful. Um, you know, looking at the whole issues of the pipeline and so on and so forth and the rallying around indigenous space. Um, you know, say, hey, you know, you know, we cannot keep degradating the earth and we can't take land from people who have taken care of the land for centuries because we need oil. We got to figure out something different. These things are coming up more, but I think they actually come up because you know some of us are playing dual roles. Like I formed these organizations because I really wanted to get out of uh, these companies because I wanted to get out of institutions. I still have a foothold in some institutions, but I know I need to have a home base that's safe because I cannot and I will not any longer subject my life to. Uh, there was a time ago where I was fired from an organization. I sat in a room with four white people. And when I left that room, I said, that's the last time that will happen to me. That's the last time. And it hasn't happened again. Because I'm not going to let it. I'm not going to be in those circumstances where my life has to be jeopardized because these folks just don't get it and don't want to get it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There, there's an urgent... Um... Uh, update with the DeFonte Miller case, and I, um, I know we're just wrapping up. If it's okay, I'm just going to jump off and just, um, just respond. But yeah. uh, I, this was the best conversation, and what a way to to go into Pride Weekend! What a way to go into this weekend of activism! I'm so honored to be with all of you. Great, thank you so much for your time. Thank Thanks, you. Iris. Good to and, see you. We'll talk soon. Did you want to finish finish with uh, a word of how you're staying hopeful? Yeah, for sure. Um, I definitely think um, in in like what's been going on in the media lately is there's a lot of, um, and then how our people re- are responding is there's a lot of pitting each other against, like pitting indigenous and black people together because like whose issues are more important. But I think what I'm hopeful for is the education of of indigenous people and how uh, how we can support Black people and how we can be supportive of each other's issues and how they're actually so, they go so hand in hand and 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 just the way that, um, even like in this conversation, like we compete for like the same pools of money, we compete for attention and all of that. And that's not so, like that's not how it has to be. And like how I see the conversations growing in like youth um, grassroots initiatives is the the desire and like, we see the need um, for each other to be working together. Like we need to be working together and like hearing each other and like holding that space with each other. And that's what I'm hopeful for is like the young people. And then, um, and and that return to the indigenous knowledge, um, it's important to see that the, that knowledge can come from all different, all um, different stages of life, mm-hmm. not just, old people not just the people in positions of power um because we all hold that power and we're all supposed to and and we're all supposed to we'll really uphold each other and like and also hold each other accountable so I think that's what I'm I'm hopeful for is um having more conversations with other young people about how how that can happen Mm. and uh so right now I'm working with Humber actually with uh a bunch of uh and other indigenous youth in the, uh, so I just want to shout them out, the um, Indigenous Transmedia Fellowship. And so we're going to be developing a project together and hopefully um, that reflects what uh, what we're seeing, like how we're responding to what's going on in, in media, but also like what we want to see in, um, in the media field and in the arts field. And yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for bearing with me. Um, that conversation of youth also has to do with my little brother. Like, I really love him. He had a really hard time today. And like, I know he's really stressed out because everyone in this house is having Zoom meetings and like, we're all like, like, we're all like, we're all in each other's space, right? Trying to be professional and all of that. So he he's dealing with a lot and I know he's seeing a lot and hearing what we're doing, but yeah. that he like, 
the future also needs to respect people like him people mm-hmm. like young people and like uh that includes not just people 18 to 25 it, it means people like 10 and under <laughs> absolutely yeah 100 yeah. percent. thank you so much i really love what you said about holding people accountable and i think that's going to be one of my takeaways is knowing that when we do hold people accountable we still are holding them, you know, it is still an embrace. It is still community. It is still, it is not, there's no negative connotation to that. It's empowering and it's a gift. Um, And both of your perspectives have been deeply empowering and very much gifts. So thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you. See you later. Yeah. Thank you so much for this conversation. I'm happy that despite all the uh, interruptions and distractions, you still made it happen. It did sound very smoothly, so it was great. Never mind it. It was really, really good. So thank you so much. Thank you. And it was our last panel for today, but we still have an art 